This is chapter 8, Monetary Policy. Chapter 13 is the physical policy. Who conducts monetary policy? The answer is the central bank. Why? Because the central bank controls the monetary policy tools. What are the monetary policy tools? The answer is interest rates and money supply. Who conducts the fiscal policies? The answer is government. Why? Because the government controlled physical policy tools. What are the physical policy tools? Government spending and taxes. So chapter A is monetary policy. The central bank conducts monetary policy in order to control the liquidity in the economy. So what is the liquidity? Liquidity is the easiness for financial assets to be converted into cash. So when the liquidity in the economy is high, that means it's easier for you to borrow money. Therefore, you're going to buy a car. You're going to get a mortgage to buy a house. That will stimulate the economy, shift aggregate demand curve to the right. At the same time, the firms will have a lower interest rate to borrow money. Therefore, when liquidity is high, it's easier for firms to borrow money from the banks at a lower interest rates. That will also shift aggregate demand curve to the right. That's an expansionary monetary policy. Therefore, in this chapter, first, we want to define money. And because the purpose of this chapter is to talk about monetary policy. Therefore, the definition of money is based on the liquidity because the purpose of the monetary policy is to control the liquidity in the economy. Therefore, in this chapter, we define money as financial assets that have 100% liquidity. That is, you can use it right away to buy things. So money in this chapter is defined in the United States as currency in circulation plus deposit. So currency in circulation is also currency outside the banks. So it's currency in your pocket. Of course, you can use your currency to buy things. So that's 100% liquidity. That's cash. That's basically cash. Deposit is your checking account deposit. You can also use your Visa check card. If you have a balance in your Visa check card, then you can use your Visa check card to buy things directly. So that is also 100% liquidity. Therefore, in this chapter, money is defined as currency outside the bank, currency in circulation, plus your checking deposit. All right. Now, we want to, again, use demand and supply analysis to analyze the market for money. Therefore, the goods now is money. And we want to draw money demand curve and money supply curve. So what do we do first? Define the variable on the x-axis and the variable on the y-axis. 
what is the variable on the x-axis? The quantity of the goods. Therefore, it is the quantity of money. Let's call it M, quantity of money. What is the variable on the y-axis? The answer is the price of the good. That is, the price of money. Then what is the price of the money? If you want to borrow money, what do you pay? The answer is interest rates. If you want to borrow money, you pay interest rates. Therefore, the price of money is interest rates. So we define the variable on the x-axis and the variable on the y-axis. Now we want to draw money demand curve and money supply curve. Let's draw the money supply curve first. Well, before you draw a supply curve, what do you have to do first? The answer is, you have to know who are the suppliers, who the suppliers are. So who are the money suppliers? Of course, you know the central bank is the one who prints money. Therefore, they are a money supplier. But in this chapter, we are going to spend a lot of time in talking about the depository institutions are also money suppliers. So money suppliers who supply money, central bank, and depository institutions. What are depository institutions? The answer is whatever financial institutions where you can deposit your money in it and you can write a check to withdraw your money. Then this kind of financial institution is called depository institutions. Say for example, the commercial banks. So your banks like Fifth Third or Chemical Banks or PNC Banks. They are all depository institutions. Also, the credit unions. Your credit unions are also depository institutions because you can make a deposit and write a check to withdraw your money. Now, let's talk about the central bank. The central bank is the public authority that regulates a nation's depository institutions. Therefore, the central bank is the boss of the banks and control the quantity of money. That is, they are the one who conducts monetary policy. In the United States, the central bank is called the Federal Reserve System, the Fed. So in the United States, we don't have a central bank. Instead, we have a central bank system. This central bank system includes three parts. The first part is the Board of Governors in DC. And then we have 12 regional Federal Reserve Banks. And then the component that is responsible for conduct U.S. monetary policy is called the Federal Open Market Committee, FOMC. So that's the three parts in the Federal Reserve System in the United States. The Board of Governors has seven members, seven board members. They are appointed by the President of the United States and confirmed by the Senate. The tenure for the Board of Governors are 14 years. It's very long. It's longer than the President's because the president can only be there at most eight years. So every board members, by theory, last longer than the president's, so that the government cannot influence 
the central bank. Another reason is the most important goal of monetary policy is to control inflation. And remember, in Chapter Twelve, we say inflation is a long-run process. Therefore, the monetary policy conductor, the central bank. The central bank's job is to control inflation. Therefore, their job is always long term. You want to have a consistent, a stable monetary policy. Therefore, you don't want to change the monetary policy makers very often. Therefore, each board member ha has fourteen years tenure. And The terms are overlapped so that one position is become available every two years. And the president appoint one members, one of the seven members, to a renewable four-year term as chairman. The U.S. central banking system is a very special central banking system because we don't have a single central bank. Why? Because Americans do not like centralized power. Therefore, we have a system. However, we think this decentralized system. There is a centralized power. Why? Because if a system is totally decentralized, then there will be efficiency problem. Therefore, we think this decentralized system, we have a centralized power, and the centralized power is the chairman, chairperson of the board of governors. Because basically, he or she controls. The agenda of the meeting, and has better contact with the Fed's staffs, and is the Federal Reserve System's spokesperson and point of contact with federal government and the foreign central banks. Therefore, the chairperson. Of the Federal Reserve System of the United States is the most, the most powerful person in the world. From this map, you can see our decentralized system. We don't have one single central bank. We have twelve Federal Reserve banks all over the country. The one in charge of Kanamazu is. The Chicago Fed. Now, the center of monetary policy is the Federal Open Market Committee. It consists of the member of the governors, seven of them, by theory. And the president of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is always there, and has a vote. For the other eleven presidents of the Federal Reserve Banks, on a rotating basis, four out of these eleven will have a vote at the same time. Therefore, how many votes are there in total? Seven plus one plus four. That's twelve. Why do we have these strange numbers? What do you think? We have seven votes from the board of governors, and five votes from the Federal Reserve banks, regional banks. Therefore, by theory, who is going to win the vote? The answer is. The board of governor will always win because they always have the majority. 
the majority of the vote. Therefore, the system is defined as this: the regional Federal Reserve banks can have voice in the meeting. However, under this decentralized system, there is a centralized power. That is, board of governor, board of governors is the one in the system that is always going to make the decision. And within the board of governors, remember, who is the most powerful person? The answer is the chairperson of the board of governors. Because he or she sets the agenda. Can you see this special system? A decentralized system, but within the decentralized system, there is a centralized power, so that we can eliminate the if efficiency problem. If you are in the stock market. You will see that every six weeks, there is a Wednesday or Tuesday. The stock market is very quiet. Why? Because the investors are waiting for the Federal Open Market Committee's decision in monetary policy. After their meeting, when they announce the meeting, the result of the meeting, then the traders start. To trade. Okay, so the Federal Open Market Committee meets every six weeks to formulate monetary policy. Why every six weeks? Why don't they meet every day, like the Congress? Remember, monetary policy is always for long run. Therefore. You don't want to change the monetary policy too often. You want to have a stable, consistent monetary policy to control the long-run inflation. Now let's talk about monetary policy tools. That is the tools that the Federal Reserve banks use to conduct monetary policy in the United States. If you bought a textbook that is older than ten years, then you will see the Fed's three monetary policy tools. You will not see these words because before two thousand and seven, two thousand and nine financial crisis, we only have three monetary policy tools. But after This financial crisis, the Federal Reserve System used more than these three traditional monetary policy tools. That is why on your new textbook you will see these words, because these three monetary policy tools are traditional monetary policy tools that we have been using for a long, long time. If you go to The Federal Reserve. The Golf website. This is a very very good website. If you're from the business school, usually your professors will tell you to read Wall Street journals. I never recommend my students to read Wall Street journals or CNN.com or MarketWatch.com. I always tell my students to go to this website. This is the website that you should use to learn anything in the financial market. On this website, under monetary policy, there's a link, policy tools. And you can see that the three traditional monetary policy tools are here: open market operation, discount rate, and reserve requirement. But there are three more right now that the Fed are using. Also, there are about eleven of 
the expired policy tools. So after the financial crisis, we have 14 more monetary policy tools. At least now, after those tools expires, we still have three more. But this is a principle of macroeconomics class. We are going to leave the other monetary policy tools to the money and banking Econ 3200. In this class, we will be focusing on the three traditional monetary policy tools. That is, required reserve ratio, discount rates, and open market operation. So what are they? We are going to talk about these one by one. But before we go to these three tools, let's understand what these three tools are. First, required reserve ratio. What is, a, what is the required reserve ratio? If you deposit $100 into your bank, whose money is it? The answer is, it's your money. Therefore, you have all the right to withdraw all your $100 from the bank anytime you want, if the money is in your checking account, right? Does that mean that your bank has to keep all your $100 cash in their safe, in their vault, just in case you come to the bank to withdraw your money? The answer is no, because the bank wants to use your money to make more money. If they keep all your money, all your cash in the vault, they cannot make any money. But if you come to the bank and try to withdraw the money and they don't have cash to give it to you, they go bankrupt. But they don't keep all your $100 in the safe. Why? Because you are not the only depositors in the bank. There are many depositors. And you are not the only, what? Well, you are not the only depositors and not all the depositors will come to the bank at the same time to withdraw all their money. Therefore, the bank can keep a portion of the depositor's deposit. They have to do the study. They have to estimate, on average, how much cash outflows will happen during a specific period of time. But it's possible that the commercial banks are too aggressive. So they keep a very small portion of the deposit in their safe and loan out all the other money. The Fed do not want to see that happen. The Fed does not want to see the commercial banks to go bankrupt because they don't have cash. Therefore, they have to set something called required reserve ratio. That is, among the deposit. What's the portion of the deposits that the commercial banks is required by the central bank to keep in their safe? And the Fed set this ratio. Therefore, the commercial bank, say for example, if the required reserve ratio is 10%, then if the bank received $100 of deposits, then the central bank would say, you have to keep at least 10%. You are required to keep at least 10%. That is 10% of the deposit. That is $10 in your reserve. So this ratio is set by the Federal Reserve Bank, and it is a policy tool, monetary policy tool. The discount rate is the interest rate that the Fed 
charges commercial banks if they want to borrow reserve from the Fed. Therefore, the Fed sets the discount rate. Why is it called a discount rate? Because when the commercial banks try to borrow reserve from the Fed, they go to the Fed discount window. To borrow discount loan. What is a discount loan? Say for example, if a commercial bank try to borrow one hundred million dollars from the Fed, the Fed agree. The Fed agrees, and then they will give the commercial bank say ninety four. Million dollars, but the commercial banks owes the commercial bank owes the Fed one hundred million dollars, but they only get ninety four million dollars. So this is a discounted value of this one hundred million dollars. So the difference will be the interest they pay. So this kind of loan is called a discount loan because you get. A discounted value of the loan you are borrowing, and discount loan is borrowed from these windows, which is called discount window. Therefore, the Fed charges the commercial banks an interest rate called discount rate on a discount loan borrowed from the Fed's discount window. Third one is the most important one. We are going to spend a lot of time on this. That is open market operation. Open market. What market? The answer is U.S. Treasury bond market. The U.S. Treasury security market operation. Purchase or sell. So open market operation is the Fed buy or sell U.S. Treasury security in the open market. Now let's go one by one. So again, reserves reserves are the cash in banks' vault and deposit at the Federal Reserve banks. When you deposit one hundred dollars into your commercial banks, what are these one hundred dollars called? The answer is, it is called your deposit. So your money in the commercial banks is called. Deposits and commercial banks money in the Fed is called reserve. So they are exactly the same concept. Let me say it again: Your money in your bank is called deposits. Your bank's money in the central bank is called reserve. Same concept, just a different name. So reserve includes. The bank's vault money and deposit in the Federal Reserve Bank, just like you keep some cash in your pocket, and you deposit some money into your checking account. So the fraction of the bank's total deposit held as reserve is the reserve ratio. Remember, reserve ratio is reserve divided by deposit. Why? Why? Remember, whose money is it? Deposit. It's your money. 
You deposit money into the bank. That's your money. You have all the right to withdraw all the money anytime you want. And the Fed do the Fed does not want the commercial banks to be too aggressive. Therefore, they are going to set a requirement. They require the commercial bank to to hold. A portion of the deposit, a portion of the deposit as reserve. So remember, required reserve ratio is set on the deposit only. In our earlier example, say for example, the commercial bank received one hundred dollars. If the Fed set required reserve ratio to be ten percent, then the commercial bank has to keep required reserve of ten dollars. That is ten percent of this one hundred dollars deposit. Can the commercial bank keep more? Of course. If they are more conservative. They may want to keep, say, for example, five dollars more reserve. They are only required to keep ten, but they decide to keep fifteen. So their total reserve is fifteen dollars because they are required to keep ten dollars, and they want to keep five dollars extra in reserve. Therefore, in this example, what is the reserve ratio? The answer is: out of one hundred dollars deposit, the bank keeps fifteen dollars. Therefore, the reserve ratio is fifteen percent. What is the required reserve ratio? Remember, required reserve ratio is set by the Fed. In our example, it is ten percent. Then, what is the excess reserve ratio? The answer is, out of this one hundred dollars deposits, the bank decides to keep five dollars of excess reserve. Therefore, the excess reserve ratio is five percent. So again, who determines the required reserve ratio? The answer is the Fed. Who determines the excess reserve ratio? The answer is the commercial banks because they decide how much extra reserve they want to keep.